Welcome to Inside Racing. Over the next two episodes, my guest is a man I've admired for most of my life. As a cricketer, Richie Bonneau attained legendary status, captaining Australia from 1958 to 1964. He scored more than 10,000 runs in first-class cricket and took more than 500 wickets. At test level, he was the first man to complete the double, 2,000 runs and 200 wickets. His distinguished media career saw him become a household name at home and overseas. For many years, Richie Benno has had more than a passing interest in horse racing, and that is the only excuse I needed to invite him to join us on Inside Racing. Richie Benno, I am indeed privileged that you've been able to see your way clear to appear on our little show. Thank you. Well, it'll uh, test me out a bit, but uh, we'll have a go. Full credit for your introduction to horse racing is attributable to your great contemporary, Neil Harvey. That's correct. Um, I'd never been to um, a race meeting before I went uh, with Lindsay Hassett's side to England 953, and Harv backed the winner of the Derby that year, and he got me interested in, um, in horse racing. And, um, there were, well, there were two people. Keith Miller was, um, was another one. And um, Miller and Harvey combined, I suppose. Miller was a great, uh, great racing man. And um, when he was a, a little kid in Melbourne, he lived at Caulfield, or just near the Caulfield racetrack. And um, he was so small that he wanted to be a jockey. And then suddenly he grew to uh, six foot four, six foot five later on, so there's obviously no chance. So he and Harve were, uh, were the two, but Harve on the tour in uh, 1953. Neil Harvey was once described by you as the most difficult batsman you ever bowled a ball at. Well, there were two... Two great players I, I had difficulty with. Uh, one was Harb, who was a marvellous player, and the other one was Arthur Morris, who was captain of New South Wales and then vice-captain of Australia. Uh, being a left-hander, Harb and, uh, and Arthur Morris, I suppose it made it in uh, a little way easier for them against a leg-spin bowler. But um, it was um, very, very difficult to, uh, to bowl to them and um, just one of those things you had to get over the top of. The thing about Harv was that people criticised him sometimes for playing at balls, and perhaps hit him for four, uh, which could have been left alone. But that's precisely the reason he was such a great player and so popular and people paid their admission money to go and watch him because he didn't like letting a ball go. Yeah. He just gave it a thrash. Mm. Well, your interest in racing embraces six decades, and during that time you've developed admiration for a small group of elite horses, and right up there at the top of the list was the gallant Dulcify. Yes, we, it was unfortunate we were actually there when uh, he broke down, and uh, we went out for the Melbourne Cup, and um, we were so sad because we were just about level with him, and um, it was at that time, uh, one of the saddest things uh, Daphne and I had known. Mm. Your very earliest recollection uh, of listening to a good horse win in a radio broadcast was the great horse Ajax, way back in the late 30s. I think you were travelling by car with your dad. Yes, we were coming from Jugiong to Sydney. My father had uh, been transferred from the Jugiong School, which had... Uh, 23 pupils, and they all came by horseback every day. Mm. And um, my father, there was a, a team went down to Jugiong every year. Uh, the Manly Club sent a team down. My father bowled them out and then made uh, 60 not out. And the guy who was travelling with the Manly team, Banner Edwards, who was headmaster of the Burnside School, Banner Edwards said, Lou, this is ridiculous. Uh, you've got to come up. Uh, and play for Central Cumberland. And um, so he did. We were on our way there, and um, Ajax 
was a pretty cumbersome radio, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yes. Uh, nothing pocket about it. Uh, mm -hmm. But Ajax was um, the first one I remember. Yeah. You loved a great sprinter, Vane. Great sprinter and uh, great sire as well. Uh, I didn't know much about siring uh, in those early days, but uh, Vane uh, captivated uh, my imagination. I was, I was very keen about him, uh, but it didn't actually see him race. You, like many Australians, uh, were swept away by the enormous amount of publicity accorded the Gundawindi Grey. <laughs> well, it was, I suppose it was um, the Gundawindi Grey nickname that captivated me first. Mm. And um, then I just uh, took an interest in everything he did. It was, it was an exciting sort of horse. He was. Mm. And he loved the attention and loved the yeah. publicity. Yeah. Yeah. And he would literally bow to a cameraman. Yeah. Amazing animal. Yeah. What about the bull striding mare Sunline? Sunline. Uh, Sunline was one of the favourites and uh, one of Daph's favourites as well. And um, we used to, to follow what she was doing and um, marvel at some of the things she did. And the unforgettable Tulloch. Well, they're talking now about whether or not black caviar is as good or better than Tulloch. The fact that he's mentioned in the same breath gives you an indication uh, of how good he had to be. Of all the modern day trainers, one of your favourites is David Hayes. And uh, this friendship and this admiration goes back a long, long way to a day when you and your teammates visited Lindsay Park. Yes, we did. Uh, but basically we visited uh, your lumber first. The West Indian team and the Australian team and about 25 other people. And it was a magnificent day. Frank Worrell and all his team were there and uh, they said it was uh, one of the great things they'd ever done. Mm. And um, it certainly was. And that was where we first saw Lindsay Park, um, just across the way. And uh, we marvelled at what they'd done there. So uh, the Hayes family, uh, Colin and Betty, uh, we knew very well, they were uh, wonderfully hospitable and um, we had a, a terrific day. And Lindsay Park was an unforgettable area and how they did it, mm. I'm never quite sure. With that three, last three furlongs on the training track, all uphill, and uh, Colin used to say that uh, if a horse did um, that uphill bit in uh, the right amount of time, mm. then uh, it was worth having a bet on, on the Saturday. He was a wonderful guy. So we've followed the family through, Betty Hayes and uh, Colin and the Hillsmiths. We've, um, we've followed them through right from those days mm -hmm. and uh, it's been fascinating to know them. Now it's David mm -hmm. who's gone to Euroa yes. but has built a, a sort of a training area, a bit like Lindsay Park with that uh, uphill last three furlongs. Your appreciation of a good horse was clearly evident just over three years ago when you and Daphne took yourselves down to Randwick Racecourse to say farewell to the great sprinter takeover target. He'd already been retired from racing, but the AJC brought him back for his last hurrah. Well, we, we heard about this and uh, we saw that Jay Ford was going to ride him and it was only going to be a furlong so we did, we went down, uh, we, we, we lived not far from Ramwick Race Course, we were at Coogee, mm. and uh, we went down and um, it was one of those things, we found the stall he was in, it was one, 119. You remember the number. Uh, yeah, and um, yeah. Uh, the two strappers were there, uh, a yeah. girl and a boy, and we stayed there for an hour mm. and just watched him and he owned the place. Just, um, not just the stall he was in, but the race course as well. Mm. He was very alert and when we went home, um, we knew we'd seen something worth remembering. You had a very valued friendship with the late Scobie Breezley. 
the legendary Australian jockey who rode a thousand winners at home and more than 2,000 in England. Did you meet Scobie in Australia or overseas? I uh, first met him overseas and he was Miller's great mate, uh, but he and uh, May became mates and friends of everyone in, in the team and uh, very hospitable people. And um, we, had a, we had a terrific time. Um, he rode Santa Claus in, um, he, he won the derby on Santa Claus. Uh, we were down to a fellow, uh, place, a fellow called Dermot Whelan, Boggy Whelan. Mm. He was a trainer, an Irish trainer, who uh, set up at Epsom. And uh, they put on this, um, this day for uh, just a few players and a few friends of Miller's. Mm. And at, um, at that day, um, Scobie said, uh, this was before the Irish derby had, had been run, mm. and Scobie said, Nugget, he said, you'd better have a good bet on Santa Claus in the derby. He said, six to one now. When it wins the Irish derby, it'll be nothing like that. So I'm there with a mate of mine, Bob Gray, who's, we're in the opposition. I was working with the Sydney Sun, he was the Sydney Mirror. Mm. And um, we... Um, decided that we were going to have a, a nice time. We had no money, as, as was the case with uh, <laughs> lots of journalists in those days. Yeah. But um, Gray and I were such good mates, although we were trying to scoop one another all the time on the sports pages, mm. um, we, um, we also um, shared lot, lots of things. When Scobie said uh, Santa Claus was going to win the derby, Flipper Lewis was there. Uh, Flipper and Nolan were there and... Um, Is this Jeff Lewis? Yeah, Jeff Another Lewis. Another jockey yeah. and a successful one. Yeah. Mm. So they got to talking about this and, um, and Nugget said, OK, he said, um, I'll do that, I'll, I'll back it. And, and Flipper Lewis um, said, um, he, the Oaks, he said, it's a bit difficult. He said, um, the horse I like very much is homeward bound. He said, but it can't run and firm going and it was a dry period mm. at that time and uh, going was uh, going was, hard was hard yeah mm. and um, Gray and I are listening to this and um, Fred Lewis then said but if it rains he said likely to win the Oaks uh, because it goes well in the very very heavy going well, there's a test match on when uh, this was happening up at uh, Trent Bridge. And Gray and I had decided uh, to pool the money. Um, Your meagre resources at our, the time. Our meagre resources. <laughs> we, yeah. uh, we, between us, we had 11 one-pound notes. We got ourselves into the situation of taking the double Santa Claus and Homeward Bound. The downpour at Epsom... <laughs> Before the Oaks. Before the Oaks. Yeah. I felt so sorry for everyone. They're in their striped suits and top hats and mm. the ladies in magnificent dresses and soaked and dishevelled. And the, uh, the announcer, the race caller, shouted, and here comes Homeward Bound, and Homeward Bound bobbed in. So between us, we had uh, just on £2,000 out, uh, out of that thing. I've got a mental picture of you sitting in the nine network commentary box at a test match somewhere in Australia on a Saturday afternoon when suddenly they cross to the races to Rose Hill or Randwick or Warwick Farm. Nine were contracted to telecast selected races back in that era. Mm. I'll bet you didn't mind those little racing interruptions. No, I, uh, it, was, it was a very good thing uh, from my point of view because it's of the interest in racing. And um, Nyan, over the years, have, they've, do, they've done all sports very well. But uh, I like Simon O'Donnell and the team. I think they do a terrific job, uh, not just from the straightforward covering of horse racing, but they're entertaining as well. So, yes, I, uh, I've got quite a bit of time for them. I don't know if you'd recall... Uh, the occasion when Dean Jones was one run short of a double century and uh, the producer uh, back in the control room in Sydney 
made the decision to cross to the races uh, because of the contract uh, that Nine held with the race clubs at that time. That young producer had to make a decision and Dean Jones was one run short of a double century. All hell broke loose. <laughs> well, yes, it did. Um, but I could understand uh, why it was done because I was um, uh, working in newspapers and television and all sorts of things to do with the media and I knew that things had to be done sometimes. Uh, and we didn't know if it might take uh, Jonesy another three or four minutes to, uh, to get the extra run. Mm. And he'd already got a hundred anyway. Yes. <laughs> you were educated at Parramatta High. In which subjects did young Bono excel? I'd like to be able to say Latin, French, and all those other things, but the answer's none. <laughs> um, I was always too interested in... I played soccer football, and in the winter I wanted to know where I was playing uh, next Saturday. And um, as for cricket, um, you couldn't put Latin up against uh, cricket for me and expect it to win. No. You were 10 years old when you first saw Bradman. Do you recall the occasion and the impact it had on you? Yeah, well, yes, it did have a, an impact. Uh, it was in uh, January 1940, I think, um, was the, uh, the date. And uh, my father had decided that we would go to the cricket for one day. Uh, we went down to Parramatta Station, railway station. We got on to uh, a steam train and we went into Central, got onto a, or into a, a toast rack tram and got out to the Sydney Quick Ground, there was a big crowd there. And when we got in, the only place we could sit was, it used to be the Sheridan stand, and it's now the Clive Churchill stand. And the only place we could sit was on a step, three steps from the top mm -hmm. of the Sheridan stand. And there were 30,400 people there for a cricket match, and that was partly because uh, Bradman was playing. Uh, McCabe was captain of New South Wales and Bradman of South Australia. And we saw New South Wales bat all day, or almost all day, and um, South Australia were two for 50, and Bradman was 26 not out. So we'd seen Bradman, and uh, that was, well, that was the first time. And um, it was, uh, was quite a memory. The thing that struck me about most about it, though, was that I'd seen Clary Grimmett bowling leg breaks, and he'd bowled out New South Wales, got six for 118. And um, when I got home, I was up early the next morning trying to bowl leg breaks up against uh, the brick wall in the backyard. You were very taken by Clary Grimmett. Yes, yeah. Met him later on, lovely guy, and one of the greatest slow bowlers the world has ever known. Uh, but he was the one um, at, ahead of Bradman and everyone else playing, ahead of McCabe. My great memory was and is of Chloe Grimmett taking those six wickets. You made your first grade debut for Cumberland at age 16. That's so. It's a, excuse me, it's a fairly young age, um, but... Yes, I was at Parramatta High School, last year at Parramatta High School, and uh, I made my debut. That was an unusual thing to do, so um, I can remember uh, I didn't do anything in the first game, which was against Glee at Jubilee Oval, uh, but um, I did enough during the year to uh, remain in first grade. You were 18 when selected with the New South Wales Colts against Queensland. I think you got 47 and three for 37. Uh, well, I can't, uh, I can't verify that, but uh, certainly it was the, the first Colts match after the war. Uh, 1948, did you yes, say? Yes, 48. Yeah. So um, it was the start of moving me along to play Sheffield Shield, which I did later on in that year. But the Colts match, uh, there were Oh, everyone in the team, the New South Wales team, went on to play uh, some form of high-class cricket. 
Then came the moment you thought would never arrive. You were selected for the fifth test against the West Indies in the 51-52 season. Now, Australia had a big lead in the series, so the pressure was off, and the selectors decided to try some fresh young talent. Yes, they did, and um, they chose uh, Colin McDonald, um, George Toms, and uh, Benno to go into the side, uh, purely experimental. They left out um, players who norm normally would play. And um, it was a very low scoring game, very grassy pitch, lively. And I think uh, in the second innings, if you added them together, the two innings of Australia and uh, West Indies, um, You'd have, uh, you've got, you'd have had less than 200 runs. Mm. So uh, it was a very grassy surface, uh, but um, a great thrill. You got your first test wicket when you got rid of a bloke called Alf Valentine. Uh, Alfred Valentine. Lovely guy. And I've always said the best number 11 ever to play test cricket. <laughs> You've dined out on that one. I have. <laughs> yeah. You played 63 tests for Australia. You got 2,201 runs and 248 wickets. Now, looking back all these years on, that's pretty good stuff. Well, that was a thrill uh, because in my last summer, I made enough runs uh, doing the double is the thing, 2,000 runs and 200 wickets. And uh, I achieved that when the South Africans were out in, uh, in Brisbane Test 963. And um, it was, it's something that I've, uh, I've treasured to be the first in the history of the game to do that. And Gary Sobers was the second in uh, 1971, eight years later. Richie, you wrote the foreword a few years back for a lovely book, a coffee table book, called Images of Bradman. And I'd love to quote, if I may, your closing paragraph in that foreword. You said, the photos taken as far back as 86 years ago are beautifully enhanced by modern methods because in this computer age, Anything is possible, except, it seems, the matching of Bradman as a cricketer and the breaking of his records. That's so. Well, I'm very pleased I, I wrote it because um, although um, in um, later times you would have people say, oh, Fred Smith's a better player than Bradman was. How could Bradman be as good as you say? And... Um, I, d I didn't see him play very much, but I knew how good he was and the people who played against him, uh, just and no, no one has ever said to me that Bradman wasn't the greatest batsman in the world. You had many dealings with Sir Donald Bradman during your years as Australian captain. Were those dealings pleasant? Yeah, yeah, uh, very good. Um, he was chairman of selectors when um, when I was captain. And uh, the three selectors were uh, Bradman, uh, Jack Ryder, who was captain of Victoria, and um, Chappie Dwyer from New South Wales. And um, I've often been asked about uh, the modern day thing where the Australian captain is a selector well, Bradman once broached it with me when I was captain. He said, um, he said when I was captain, he said, um, I uh, was also a selector. He said, have you ever given any thought to, to that? And I said, I don't want to be a selector if I'm captain. And I, and I added, when you and Jack and Dudley sit down and then you bring a bit of paper and give it to me and there are 12 names on it. I said, that's all I want. I don't want to be sitting in a room 
choosing those players. And the other thing I can say to you is that I never played for New South Wales or Australia when there was a coach. Never, ever. Hmm. Did he ever invite you to recommend or nominate or suggest a player that the selectors hadn't considered? No, no. Then if, if that had been done, I would have been interfering with the selection. I didn't want to do that. I just wanted the team they chose because from that moment on where the piece of paper was handed over, hmm. that was my team. Didn't belong to the selectors anymore. Join us next week for part two of Inside Racing with Richie Benno.